اللہ صلی اللہ سیدنا و نبینا و مولانا محمد و بارک صلی اللہ We are in Surah Al-Rum. This is the next Surah. The Surah after Al-Ankabut. This is Surah number 30. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Al-Rabim. Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Alif Lameen. Ghulibat Al-Rum. في أدنى الأرض وهم من بعد غلبهم سيغلبون في بضع سنين لله الأمر من قبل ومن بعد ويومئذ يفرح المؤمنون بنصر الله ينصر من يشاء وهو العزيز الرحيم وعد الله لا يخلف الله وعده ولكن أكثر الناس لا يعلم This surah is called Surah Al-Rum, referring to the Byzantine Romans of the East, where they were there in Syria and Sham, and they were fighting at that time, the time of the Prophet Wasallam's now stay in Mecca, and they were fighting the Persians. The Quraysh, who were known as great negotiators, political negotiators with uh, tribes and leaders in the south in Yemen, and also with leaders and tribes in the north, they also had representation with the Persians, the Khusrus. And they also had representation with the Christians, the Romans, the Byzantines. Yes. Abu Sufyan, in a famous hadith that is narrated by Bukhari and others, stood up in front of the Byzantine emperor, Hercules Tirakhal, and gave an understanding of who the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is in front of him. As they trod in the time the Prophet spent in Medina. The Quraysh at this time had, if not a political alliance, but at least a psychological alliance and preference with and to the Persians. They were not aligned politically with the Byzantines, the Romans, the Christians. So the Persians, at the time when this surah was revealed, had gained momentum in the war between the Persians and the Romans. And they were defeating the Romans battle after battle. So this the Quraysh knew, meaning they understood the world view at that time. They're very organized, sophisticated in their understanding of that part of the world. And they saw that their alignment with the Persians was a manifestation of the divine being aligned with them politically in terms of a resistance against Muhammad Because the Muslims were aligning themselves with the Romans because they were Christian. And the Christian is much closer to the deen of Muhammad وسلم, than the pagan Arabs and the Zoroastrians. The Zoroastrians, they worshipped fire and the pagan Arabs, they worshipped idols. So, since the people of... Uh, you know, the Ahl Kitab, people of the book, they were also uh, inclusive of the Christians. They uh, did not see that their alignment with the Christian, the Roman Empire, was in good standing with the divine and with their deities and their false gods. 
So they use this political event and momentum to taunt the Prophet Sallallahu and the Sahaba. Then you can see that Islam is influence on the minds of the Quraysh was very real. That they even guided their political understanding of the world in terms of their their religion. So they would say to Muslims, if your God was good, then why would he give the Zoroastrian Persians victory over your Friends who are the Christians. It's taunting them in their everyday appearances, their transactions, their dealings with Muslims in the bazaar, or in the streets, in social events. And they made this a, a food for public gossip. Right. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu being the foresighted gifted person with immense insight and basira and basara both and who understood the world events who understood how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings down his fadl and he understood how people are and what people will do as he was to become the first khalifa after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam he made a bet with a mushrik a polytheist, who was one of the leaders of the Quraysh, and said, I bet you that within certain years, the Christians will overcome the Persians. The Romans will overcome the Persians. He made a bet. One side of that. So, no, one side, two sides. So in Makkah it was allowed. Before the prohibition of gambling came in Medina. So this is a person who is a mushrik, who is taken aback and said, you're willing to risk so much money because you have a belief in your God that he's going to give these people victory over the Persians. And the Persians were just uh, over powerful, overwhelming civilization and an army that could not be uh, destroyed. This is from the sheer numbers. Yeah, the Husmus. So th- he said yes. Okay. So now one year passed, two years passed, three years passed, five years passed, six years passed. So now this Mushrik who remembered the bet with Abu Bakr said to Abu Bakr, take me to your leader, yeah, Muhammad, and then I will demand from him that you pay up because you lost the bet. So Abu Bakr said, no, I haven't. He said, okay, take me to your leader. Let him decide. Yeah. So Abu Bakr said, okay. So he took him to the Prophet and explained the situation in the bet. And then uh, this mushrik told the Prophet وسلم, that uh, his term has expired, he has to pay up. So the Prophet وسلم, asked the mushrik, what did he say exactly? What was the word he used for term or time? So he said he used the word bid'ah. Fi bid'ah sinin in the fourth ayah, in ayah number four. In the beginning it says, Fi bid'i sinin, bid'ah. Abu Bakr, being the master of Arabic, mashallah, alhamdulillah, he used the word not fi ba'adi, okay, which sounds the same if you exchange the da'ad and ayn, so that ba'ad, some years, he said fi bid'i. So the Prophet said, are you sure he said bid'ah and not ba'ad? Yes, it was bid'ah. Not now. So then you still have time. So why? Is it because you know and I know that the word bid'ah in Arabic may refer to anything between three and nine years. And nine years have not expired yet. So the mushrik conceded and said, okay, 
I'll give you that. We'll wait. In the ninth year, this is what happened. So this is how the surah begins. Alif la mim. Only Allah knows what these letters mean. Ghulibatu rum. That the Romans have been defeated and crushed. Fi adna al In the nearer land, which was to the south of the Byzantine. It was closer to Persia and closer to Arabia. And then, after their defeat, they will be victorious soon. For sure. When? In this number of years, which may be from three to nine. لِلَّهِ الْأَمْرُ مِنْ قَبْلُ وَمِنْ بَعْدِ to Allah alone belongs the command before the victory and after the victory. And on that day, وَيَوْمَ إِذِينْ يَفْرَحُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ When that day came, when the Byzantines overpowered the Persians, uh, believers rejoiced and they were happy and they were happy. This is what happened. So then they overcame the Persians and this ayah was revealed or this sequence of ayat were revealed and the believers in Mecca, along with the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr, they were very happy. Wa'adullah. Binasrullah. They were happy with Allah's help coming. Yansuru man yasha. It is Allah who helps whomever He wishes. Wahul Aziz al Rahim. He is the overwhelming, the supreme, and also the immensely merciful. Wa'adullah. It is the promise of Allah. لا يخلف الله وعده الله ولا تدلي أن go against his promise ولكن أكثر الناس لا يعلمون but most people they do not know so Allah revealed this ayah before the time of the victory came and that is the meaning of وعد الله the promise of Allah so there are a number of issues here in the background and the backdrop and the story circumstances of revelation which we must appropriate in the light of what's known as international relationships and international politics and this ayah and this surah is from the Meccan period which is revealed in Mecca not in Medina so this surah talks about the theories and the paradigms of non-Muslims living in non-Muslim lands. How do we see them? How do we objectify them? How do we qualify them? How do we quantify them? This, and as in Mecca, at that time was Darul Harb. It was the abode of non-Muslims. And Muslims were living there, albeit in a very persecuted state. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu being the Khalifa of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had already developed the ability to look at world events and see which world event is going to benefit Muslims more or less. And that's how his vision was always for the Muslim that this is how we align ourselves in the doctrine of Tawheed, of monotheism, of being close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a lesson of world politics, international relationships, and how to see world events through the lens of Tawheed. This is a big lesson. So, first, what comes out is that these ayat speak specifically of Abu Bakr. Without mentioning his name. Okay? Otherwise, you would not understand what these ayat mean. That's the story. And the story is through the consensus of the Mufassirun. They will agree that this is what happened. And this ayat, or this sequence of ayat were revealed for uh, promoting the intelligence of Abu Bakr. Radiallahu ta'ala an. Okay? You don't need to mention the name in the Qur'an, but we know that you will know through your seerah, 
and through the historical accounts that this is what happened and this is why this surah uh, was revealed. Number two is that when uh, there are things that happen in the world, then the Muslim must be aware of what happens. A Muslim cannot afford to remain oblivious of world events and say that I don't care. This is not leadership. If you want Muslims to be leaders, they must be aware or informed at least of what happens in the world around them. This is Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. So the Quraysh, they were, they were also, as I said, great negotiators and uh, they had the ability to align themselves and form allegiances with other groups and other countries and other rulers. That's how their trade worked. Abu Bakr was part of that trade okay, campaign that the Quraysh had and he also knew where his uh, loyalties were. After Islam, his loyalties now were managed, regulated, and trimmed by Tawheed. This is Allah. And this is not Allah. This is how we worship Allah, and this is how we don't worship Allah. Those who worship Allah, even though they may have a distorted method, They are still closer to us in theory than those who don't worship Allah. Meaning the pagan Arabs and the Zoroastrians, those who worship fire. So those who worship fire, they don't worship God. They worship something other than God. Like the mushrik in Mecca, he doesn't worship God, he worships so many of his false gods. So my Tawheed tells me that I must align myself with this a Christian who at least says that there is a God and he recognizes the same God that we have except that his mode and method of worship is now uh, distorted and corrupt because he's gone astray. But he has the basic understanding of Jesus and the basic understanding of who God is, etc. We don't subscribe to his religion but we say theoretically he's closer to us. So when you are theoretically closer to some institution or a country, then you align yourself with something that's closer to you, not something that's further from you, even though it may appear that someone who's further uh, in in reality may become closer to you through politics and diplomatic relationships and what have you. So this is Abu Bakr's now foresight and his understanding of world events that in world events, Muslims must do this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came down with this ayah, with these ayat and this surah to uh, confirm the position of Abu Bakr and his thinking that this is now, as uh, this ayah says, uh, through, with Allah's help, that the Muslims rejoiced because Allah's help came. But Allah's help didn't come to the Sahaba in Makkah. Where did it come? It came to the Christians. In Syria. Or when they were fighting the Persians. So now, this is a categorical statement which tells us that, look, in the understanding of the world, how it works, how it doesn't work, any event that brings you or other people closer to you is the beginning of Allah's help. What? Is the beginning of Allah's help. And that's the only way you would explain this. Otherwise, there would be no reason for Omar, hmm, later on as a second Khalifa, to go out and defeat the Byzantines and the Romans. You understand? And Muslims didn't make a fuss over it. Omar Allah says, this is, when they defeated the Persians, it was Allah's help. Now why are you going to defeat people uh, who brought Allah's help? Huh? So what is Allah's help? Allah's help 
comes in phases and in stages, in forms and through different ways and methods, what have you. This was the beginning of Allah's help to the Prophet Sallallahu and to Abu Bakr and to the Muslims that this process, now this victory of of the Romans over the Persians is the beginning of Allah's help. And that is what the Muslims saw. وَيَوْمَ إِذِي يَفْرَحُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ and the day when the believers rejoiced. Why did they rejoice? Because of Allah's help. Allah. In which sense that eventually these chain of events will lead to uh, the Muslims coming on to the political scene and the international scene and then Allah's help will be complete when Muslims have victory. Right. And this foresight and this ability to see this was that of Abu Bakr. And that is why he was the first Khalifa. <coughs> Nobody else saw this. Even though Omar was here at this time, he was a Muslim at this time, he didn't see this. Okay. Abu Bakr saw it. <coughs> that is why at the time of Sulah Hudaybiyah, when the Prophet ﷺ drafted an agreement of diplomatic relationships between himself and the Quraysh of Mecca, uh, what do you call it? Uh, it looked like a concession that the Muslims conceded so many uh, issues to the Quraysh and it felt like a surrender. As you know from the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, which you must have read in Sirah, and you can still read it if you haven't. So most of the Sahaba were, were not too happy with the conciliatory tone of the Prophet ﷺ conceding so many terms to the Quraysh. And Omar came to Abu Bakr and said, do you really think this is a victory? The Quran was revealed, Inna fatahna laka fatha mubina, after the treaty was signed. That indeed we have given you an open victory. The Sahaba was sitting there scratching their heads. And he came to Abu Bakr, a fatun what, what kind of victory is this? You've conceded everything to the Quran. Abu Bakr looked at him. It's a victory. Then, meaning the, 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 Political acumen of Abu Bakr was so immense that he saw what the Prophet saw and he saw how Allah creates events in the world. One thing after one thing leads to another. The domino effect. So that was now confirmed by the Quran by saying that the believers will rejoice on that day because of Allah's help. Allah's help came to the Christians. So why are Muslims rejoicing? Because the Christians defeated the Persians. Because Abu Bakr knew this is going to trigger another set of events where the Quraysh will become weak, the Zoroastrians will become weak, and the Christians will also become weak. And when that happens, Muslims will have victory. Wa'ad Allah. Allah's promise. So these set of ayat are a proof that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recognizes the acumen of Abu Bakr. Must much to the disdain of others who might say he was no good. This is a confirmation from the Quran. لا يخلف الله وعده ولكن أكثر الناس لا يعلمون But most people, they do not know. So, when Allah chooses someone to become a Khalifa or to be the leader of the Muslim Ummah, He will inspire ideas and knowledge in that person's mind and heart and that will allow him to see and observe world events in such a way that he will calculate and predict this is how things are happening in the world. And this is how things happen in the world. So a reading of history and a reading of what's known as Ayyamullah. <coughs> There's a word, a phrase in the Quran, which came at the time of Muhammad. <coughs> Again, a battle in warfare. These are the trials and days 
and victories and defeats that we rotate amongst people. So losing one battle doesn't mean to say you lost the war. And winning one battle doesn't mean that you won the war. These things, they rotate. It's for the military general and it's for your political leader to understand how Allah regulates these events and how to interpret them. So now, this is called the interpretation of world events. The interpretation of stories. Why is that important? Because the Quran gives us now two types of interpretation. Both mentioned in the same word in Surah Yusuf. Hmm. And that is Ta'wil al-Ahadith. That word is what? Ta'wil, interpretation of Ahadith events. Wa'allamani min Ta'wil al-Ahadith. Wa'allamtani min Ta'wil al-Ahadith. Yusuf alayhi salam says, when he comes into Egypt and he honors his parents and he is there on the throne of Egypt, as a leader, a minister, then he makes dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he thanks him by saying that I thank you for everything you've given me and what is one thing he thanks him for? That you have taught me the interpretation of events. عَلَّمْتَنِي مِن تَأْوِيلِ الْأَحَادِيثِ What is ta'wil of dreams? That you interpret dreams. And the other is, you interpret world events, a hadith. So, there are two sciences. One is very uh, tangible. It's about forecasting, predicting. And the other is intangible, which is abstract. And that is the world of dreams. Right? The world of dreams. You have a dream, it occurs in your subconscious, conscious, wherever it occurs. But it's abstract. That abstract reality has a form. You, your brain, whoever sees that form, uh, now relates it in words, and those words are then interpreted by the interpreter. That's called ta- ta- ta'abiru ru'ya, or ta'wilul ahlam, the interpretation of dreams. So the king saw seven cows. This, this one, in Surah Yusuf. Now, how do you get from the form of a cow to the interpretation of a cow as a year? Because Yusuf al-Islam interpreted each cow as being one year. Right. Now, how do you get from there to there? That's abstract. Okay. So, you need a creative mind. But that creative mind has to coincide with the real world, which is here. Okay. So, that... Quality has to be quantified with an interpretation. Who gives you that ilm? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Yusuf al-Islam that knowledge whereby he would be able to interpret abstract realities that people see in the world of dreams and bring them down to earth literally and say this is what it means. So you saw seven fat cows and seven lean cows and they mean yours. So you'll have seven years of prosperity and seven years of adversity. Your seven-year cycle in the economy. Right. Now how do Yusuf now recognize that? So he thanks Allah for giving him that ability to look into the abstract and then interpret because this is a knowledge that all prophets have. Every prophet is given the knowledge of interpretation of dreams. It is part of Nabuwa. Right? Every dream of every prophet is true, and it's wahi, because he has to act upon it. So Ibrahim alayhi salam interpret dreams. Everybody from there to Yusuf and everybody else, they all interpreted dreams. The prophets also interpreted dreams. Okay? Right. That's one science. Science of the abstract to the real. That Abu Bakr excelled in during the time of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, which is known through hadith. That in Medina, the Prophet ﷺ frequently would sit after Fajr and ask if any of the Sahaba had a dream. 
if they had a dream, he would interpret that dream. And if they didn't, he would say, I had this dream and I will interpret for you. On many occasions, Abu Bakr would insist that the Prophet ﷺ allows him to interpret the dream. And the Prophet ﷺ would say, yes, you may interpret the dream. And he would get the interpretation right. Who? Abu Bakr. Right? So Abu Bakr's intellectual ability uh, was far superior than the intellectual abilities of all the other Sahaba because he was the closest to the Prophet ﷺ in his Sahaba, in his companionship. Before that, in Makkah, Abu Bakr was given the ability to forecast and predict events. That wheel of hadith also refers to reading events, reading stories. So you can do it the other way. What is the proof of this? That the Sahaba and the Tabi'un, the students of the Sahaba, would sometimes interpret hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in such a way as if they were interpreting a dream. The Prophet ﷺ went and he stood by a well. Abu Bakr came, he stood next to him. Umar came and he stood on the other side of the well. Uthman came and there was no space for him to stand anywhere. This happened as part of the seerah. It is a real event in real time. And this hadith is reported by Bukhari and other people. The Sahaba and the Tabi'un, the Tabi'i who narrates this hadith, Sa'id ibn Musayyib, rahimahullah, says that from this story, I interpreted the story. Awwaltuhu. I interpreted the story to signify their graves. That the Prophet ﷺ will be buried. Next to him will be Abu Bakr. And next to him will be Umar. But Uthman will not be buried the same place where they are buried. This is called Ta'wil. Why? Because the Tabi says, Awwaltu. I made Ta'wil of this story in the Seerah. I interpreted. So interpretation may come from this side, the abstract to the real, it may, came, it may come from the real to the abstract. Right. This is all in the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba and the Tabi'un. So now, Abu Bakr was able to read world events and predict and forecast for the benefit of the Muslims. No, he could forecast futures and options. He'd be a trillionaire. Right. But his mind and heart was not about the dunya. He was an interest in the dunya. He said, "This I want Allah's nas, nasr and nusra and fadl and assistance and help to come to the ummah and come to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam." So that was his preoccupation. How do I read this world event that's happening in the life of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to see which way Allah? is now going to determine his uh, fadl. So he said to the uh, mushrik of Quraysh that uh, this is the beginning of the end for the Zoroastrians as a continent, yeah. as a continuous chain of events that will eventually lead to the Nusr of Allah coming to the Muslims. One thing has to come first, then the second event, and then the third event. This is the Genius of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, and who better to lead the ummah after Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam than a man who can interpret reality into the abstract and who can interpret abstract into reality? No one except Abu Bakr. At this time, Ali was a young boy. At this time, Makkah, Ali was a young boy. He was not a mature adult. I was a Sahabi, I a million times much more mature than we ever will be. But in comparison to Omar, he's a young boy. And in comparison to Abu Bakr, he was a young boy. 
and to Uthman he was a young boy. So what we are saying is that these ayat prove the authenticity of Abu Bakr's reading of reality and Abu Bakr's intelligence and Abu Bakr's knowledge. When you have that, then he becomes the gate for all the victories of Umar and all the victories of Uthman radiallahu anhu. So this is a, a historical context so that we appreciate that when we read these ayat, we must read these ayat against the backdrop of the seerah. Because if you didn't know this story, you would not be able to articulate what it is these ayat are saying. The more. So now, we see this as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's fadl upon Abu Bakr and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that uh, he gave these people such intelligence and uh, such knowledge that we benefit from even today. And uh, Muslim leaders who want to, the community to become leaders, they must understand this. How is that developed? Mm -hmm. That ability to read now ahadith, stories and events and incidents in the world and the ability to interpret and translate dreams. By first of all, believing that it is a science. (laughs) Don't reject any reality. Mm -hmm. Don't fend off and brush aside dreams. These are just dreams. Yes, they are just dreams, but some dreams are very crucial in your lives. Allah is probably saying something to you in that dream. Right? So you get it interpreted. So the, the, this, the, the, the science of dream interpretation is passed down from heart to heart. People have written manuals, but they don't work. They're just the manual for the interpreter, not for you. So when you have a dream, you don't go to the book of Ibn Sirin online. Then there's a cat means this, this and that. But which one do you apply to your dream? Right? So it changes the person, it changes the season, it changes with who's there, who's not there. There are so many details. It becomes an art. But people can learn from other people who interpret dreams. This dream means this and you can gauge and you develop the ability and eventually you'll get permission also to do that. But this is one science that is needed so that the ummah is guided. Mm-hmm. Guidance comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One form of guidance, it is it's called wahi, and that is qatri, it is conclusive. You cannot mess with it. Right? Allah says, لَتَدْخُلُنَّ الْمَسْجِدَ الْحَرَامَ إِنْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ آمِنِينَ مُحَلِّقِينَ رُؤُسِكُمْ قَصَّرِينَ لَا تَخَافُونَ that most certainly indeed you will be entering the haram after Fatih Hudaybiyah uh, that you will be entering the haram in peace and security and you will be able to do your tawaf and whatever rituals of Umrah you need to and then you will shave your heads or you will cut your hair so this is wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more than a prediction it is wahi you don't say wahi is a prediction it is wahi period it is going to happen. It's a done deal. Right? Meaning the day of judgment is a done deal. It will happen. It's not a prediction. <laughs> so you don't need Nostradamus to predict anything. Wahi is a done deal. It's finished. Khlas. In the, our knowledge of Allah is done. That knowledge comes to a prophet. Those who are close to the prophets and to the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a different type of guidance, which is very powerful, but it's lesser in authenticity than wahi. Right? This is what the Sahaba relied on for their leadership. The Sahaba did not rely on quantified okay, formula for projection that you have these quantified formulae. And with these quantified formulae through economics and through business and finance or what have you, or whatever you calculate uh, through your military acumen, this was going to happen. No. Okay. That ability came from something called nur. 
ruhaniya, spirituality. That the closer you are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet وسلم, the more guidance you receive from the same niche. The niche being the mishkat. So when you're close to the lamb and the lantern and to the niche, then you receive now guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is not conclusive. It is inconclusive. But when a whole group of people receive that amount of guidance, then they are rightly guided. They have to be. Right? Because then they will agree upon that guidance and say, this is what's going to happen. So here we see that this surah is saying that in order for you to appreciate world events, we do have a, an example. In the seerah of Muhammad wasallam, so that you're not totally bereft and you're not left misguided. That how do I see events in the world in terms of politics, in terms of world leadership? He said we have guidance through Abu Bakr, which the Quran appreciates, acknowledges, authenticates and confirms. So now we must follow who? Abu Bakr. And that's what the Prophet said. The second is called that Allah speaks to certain people through ilham. With Abu Bakr there is, is, is something higher than ilham. It's a state. There's no, no, it's just something that's basira. It's just there. The inside is there. With Umar of the Allah is slightly lower than that. It's called Muhdath, that he is spoken to. Not that Wahi comes to him. We don't believe that. That's soon. Wahi didn't come to Abu Bakr nor to Umar. But the Prophet ﷺ said that there were people before me who were not prophets, but Allah spoke to them. And that is guidance again from the other world. So these two, Abu Bakr and Umar, have been confirmed. And that is why some of the ayat of the Qur'an were now uh, preempted by Umar radiallahu before they were revealed. Yeah. Certain scholars like Jalal bin Suyuti said he found 17 places where the Quran came almost with the same words as Umar had Allah to bring down. Right. That is, the three or five of them are confirmed. What I'm saying is that when you are close to the mind of the Prophet ﷺ and you're close to the ruh and the spirit of the Prophet ﷺ, you are invariably going to become like him. And you will take on the color through your suhbah and you will think like him. And when you think like him, your conclusions will be almost as powerful as his. And that's what's called leadership. So the, the, the way to develop Muslim leadership is to say, first of all, acknowledge Abu Bakr and Umar, and secondly, acknowledge that there's another realm out there through which guidance comes. That's the realm of spirituality, the realm of ibadat and dhikr and dua, and the realm of reading the Quran and being pious and doing the nawafil, etc. Because that's what they did. Yes, mundane Understanding of the world is good, but that's not enough. You need something more than the mundane understanding, and that is what the next ayah refers to, which we will do next time. Yeah, so the difference between understanding the world the way the world understands it, and understanding the world the way Abu Bakr and Umar understood it. It's a big difference. And that is why. We appreciate the khidmat, the services of Abu Bakr and Umar because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did indeed inspire them towards the truth even though it was not wahi, they were not infallible. They are the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and uh, there is no nabi nor any nabuwa after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So with this said, we make dua Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the knowledge of whatever is beneficial to us in this world and the world hereafter and allow us to appreciate all the good work of all the other Muslims who came before us. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala khayil 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 khay